Good afternoon. I'm Frank Conkling, and this is Panda Consulting's ArcGIS Workshop. Today, we're going to look at something a little bit different. If you've actually been following us or watched some of our videos over the last couple of years, you'll notice that I constantly am talking about how great ArcGIS Pro is. And I truly believe it's, a, it's light years ahead of where ArcMap was and trying to convince people to move over from ArcMap. And we've gotten to a point now with ArcMap going and, and um, getting out of support and, and sort of being stopped as far as any development on it, that it's time and people are starting to look there. But I think a lot of people got the impression that what I really was saying was that, oh, you don't need the parcel fabric. But that's not really the case. The reality is that if you maintain parcels, you should be maintaining them in the parcel fabric, not in simple polygons. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at why. Why would I want to do that? And what benefits do I have by putting and maintaining my parcels in the parcel fabric above and beyond just simple polygons? Before we start, just real quickly, let me point out the QR code in the lower right corner of the slide. This is, will get you, if you scan it and, and, and click on the link, it will take you to Panda Consulting's website, in which it will explain who we are, what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Again, Panda is an ESRI business partner for over 25 years now. We are a silver partner. We have the, we are actually, we're the first ESRI business partner in the nation to get the parcel management specialty. We've been working with them on the parcel fabric since early holistic testing. We also have a release ready specialty and the state and local government specialty. If you are here and attending the meeting live, thank you. And uh, unfortunately we don't have Chris moderating today. So if you will put any questions or comments over in the chat window, I will look at them and make sure that they get addressed and uh, so I give you a chance to contribute and ask questions and make sure that, that things are answered. So let's start, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're really gonna focus on four distinct areas of why is the parcel fabric better? The first one's gonna be the structure, how it's constructed and how it's more than just lines and polygons in here, how it's built and how it's constructed and what the overall design is of the parcel fabric. The second thing is we're going to talk about the functionality of that structure. Why do we have all of these additional components in there? And we'll look at that and, and we'll spend more than half of our time going through those first two items. Then the third item we want to talk about is workflow. Why is it easier to go and maintain edits in the parcel fabric than it is polygons? We're going to talk about that. And finally, and I hope you stick around long enough, we're going to talk about transparency. Why is it important that we begin to think about how we maintain our parcels and abandon earlier models, earlier ways that we did things? So here we go. Let's just look at the structure of the parcel fabric. All right, and this is a conceptual model. This is how it's all supposed to fit together. The first thing we find out is that we everything in the parcel fabric centers around what's commonly called a record. Now, this is a reference to a document that, that causes or is the reason why things in your data changed. This can be a deed of conveyance, which goes and, and says that you're conveying an ownership interest in a portion of a property, so you have to go and figure out where that that portion is and then split the parcel. Or it could be a subdivision that's been approved within your jurisdiction and you wanna get that information in, but it always refers back to some sort of a document, a legal document, often, sometimes it isn't, but it's some sort of a document that causes the changes in your data so that Overall, the design was that you could create some sort of lineage. You, you had some way of tracking what was going on, why it was going on. The next element in here within the design was the fact that there was a recognition that it was more than just 
tax parcels. There are different types of elements that you're going to be mapping, these different parcel types. For example, one organization may have, may have parcels that represent tax obligation. And these are this is the most often one is a tax parcels on here, or possibly it's easement rights that might be given, or subdivisions, or lots, or sections, or public land survey system, and it goes on and on. We've implemented systems that have everything from one parcel type to as many as 20 different parcel types on there. The parcel fabric is flexible enough to be able to take all of these. The good thing is you design, you or your consultant will design what parcel types are you going to bring in, how are you going to manage them and such. The next part of this overall conceptual model is that each parcel type each parcel type will have its own polygon layer and its own line layer. You're not going to share lines between parcel types. They're going to have their own set of lines and their own set of polygons. And then one further layer beyond that is each of these polygons or lines are going to represent the current state of that information. Is that information current? Or is it some sort of historical state where it was current at one time, but something has impacted it, a record has impacted it, and it now is current or his, is historical? So that you have these options on here, and you can say whether or not a line is still a current line, or whether it's something that was from the past that got changed, and they be able to track why did it get changed, who changed it, when did they change it, all of that. So overall, that's the conceptual design of this, that everything goes back to, everything funnels back up to this record, this document that caused these things to occur. And just to make sure you understand, a document can be a couple of different things. It can be a a public land survey system township plat, which defined where the sections are and should have been, that sort of thing. Or it could be a subdivision plat, or it could be an easement document, or a lease, or condominium documents. There's all sorts of documents that define legally where separations in interest, land interests occur. That's the overall design. All right, and now let's look at a logical data mine, this model, this is how it's actually working inside the computer system. Inside the system, there is an object. There is a object that contains code called a parcel fabric controller object. And that parcel fabric controller object has a list of the records. And again, these records then have, they, they understand what parcel types are related to them, what lines were related to those individual parcel types, what polygons were related to them, what points were related to the records, what connection lines. A connection line is a non-boundary line. It can be thought of as, with a meets and bounds description, the lines are courses that go from the point of commencement to the point of beginning, or it can be meander lines, it could be any sort of non-boundary type of line that you wish to go and include inside a record. It might have been called out on a survey. It might have been called out on a, a plat or, or a subdivision as just something that contributes to the location of where something is, you know, spatially. So those are all able to be related to a record in here. In addition, and this is where some of the computer technology comes in, we also have topology rules. Those topology rules um, allow it to go and say, what is the minimum elements that are required to define what a parcel is? And just to let you know, the, the minimum topology rules inside the parcel fabric says that every line has to have a point at the end of it, representing a corner within legal elements that these lines don't have dangles. They don't have overshoots. They can't self-overlap. They can't self-intersect. 
And that a line has to be on the boundary of a parcel. You can't have just straight lines out there. You actually have to have them associated with a, the lines have to be associated with a polygon, which has to be associated with a record. So, and then finally, you've got one final rule, which is that every polygon has to be covered by lines so that you can see where those boundaries are defined by. Those are the topology rules. The parcel fabric helps maintain those topology rules. There's also a thing called attribute rules. And these, by default, there's nothing in there other than uh, there's one rule that says everything has to be associated with a record. So that's a, a validation topology rule. But as part of your overall design for the parcel fabric, you're allowed to go and say, okay, let me start thinking about my data is there some way that we can define, for example, how a parcel number should be constructed or what the length of that parcel identifier should be so that we can start ensuring that not only are things spatially related to one another, but they, are, they contain valid attributes in them. Or it might be that maybe one of our attributes is what subdivision is this lot located in? Well, an attribute rule can be created to automatically populate those attribute fields for you. So it makes the mapper's job much easier. Again, there's a lot of detail in here, but none of this comes with simple polygons. And this is sort of the heart. And this is the core of designing your parcel fabric. What is it going to look like? How is it going to work? All right. So to come around a little bit, a parcel type. Every parcel type, as we said, has its own set of lines and its own set of polygons on there. These lines and polygons also have an attribute that says, is this line current or is this line historic? And inside RTS Pro, when we're working with the parcel fabric, we have the ability to go and see our current, you see our historic, compare the two, work on them, find out where things were coming from. This is part of the parcel type standard. This is how it's put together. And this is part of the overall design. By the way, the other things is in your table content, you'll see a records feature class. It's going to show us where the records are. This is the topology associated with it. These are points and these points can, can can include not just normal points at the ends of lines, but geodetic or control points that have characteristics which don't allow them to be moved. If you've gone out there and you've cap you've you've captured the coordinate values for a point and you want that to be something that holds and you use that to control the location of everything else inside the parcel fabric, you can put that in there and you can tell it don't let this be moved and it will follow that as you go along all right let's look at the structure so in here and this is interesting at this is the minimum structure within the parcel fabric the first thing and most important thing is this right here this is you have an identifier by default it's called name it can be you can put an alias in there if you want or you could put a, a secondary one if you don't like name and have it automatically calculate back and forth using an attribute rule. But the important thing is you have an identifier for a polygon within there. But then there's other things. For example, there is a created by record. That created by record is meant to go and link back to the record so that that document, again, so that this is the document that created this polygon. At the same time, if it's retired or historic, it has a link back to the document that was used to mark that thing historic. And we're going to demonstrate how this all works. The next polygon attribute field that's really important is stated area. Often on a, a deed, you'll have an area stated on the actual document itself within the legal description, usually at the end. 
let's say containing five acres plus or minus. The stated area is meant to go in and record and store what did this deed originally say this document, this, this parcel should be. And you can put it in there. Also, you can note that you also can put in the stated area unit. Was it square feet? Was it acres? Was it hectares? What was it that was defined in here? So those two there, you don't get those with um, standard polygons. Calculated area. This is a field that gets automatically calculated and shows you not what did the deed say, but what was it actually mapped as. We've been struggling with this for a long time, and we could define um, as we're we're going through the different data models in in parcel mapping and the eras in parcel mapping. How do we handle this? Because we know that often you'll make adjustments, and sometimes that that calculated area, that mapped area, will not match the deeded acres, and you want to be able to compare those. And say why. Next field. And again, these, these are important fields. These are automatically calculated by the parcel fabric, misclosure ratio. If you, in fact, have a parcel which has been described by a meets and bounds description or one that was constructed using a Travers tool or any of the COCO tools, it will calculate that if it's supposed to close, how far it it is from closing. So what is a closure? Well, if I start with a parcel here and I go here to here to here, the closure is how close I am to actually finishing up at the starting point. This distance here, this is called the misclosure distance. That distance divided by the overall perimeter is the misclosure ratio. And here's the misclosure distance. So those two tell you sort of the quality of, of the traverse or the quality of the description if it's a meets and bounds description on there. Is it the seed? This has to do with the actual parcel fabric itself. But there's editor tracking. So it tells you who created this thing. Where was it created? What has it been modified since it was created? And when was that modification occur? So this is the minimum attribution associated with a polygon inside of a parcel type in the parcel fabric. Let's look at lines. Lines become really important in here. And that lines are, are intended to go and store the information about what the boundaries were originally intended to be, how they were defined. And we have things such as, and you'll see the same as, as in the polygons, when was it created? What was the record or document that created it? What was the document that retired it? And then you've got the, the traditional type of cocoa lines. Direction line, this is the bearing, for the most part, if we use quadrant bearing. This is the direction of that line that is is shown on the record, the distance, if it's got a curve, what's the radius, what's the arc length, what about a spiral curve? That's something we haven't done before. Inside the parcel fabric, we can do spiral curves. Spiral curves are things like railroad centerline curves, um, the um, on-ramps and off-ramps inside of a um, high-speed Super highway, those are all spirals. They are not real true curves. They're spirals usually. Um, this next one here, this cocoa type, we're going to look at it closer. That's really important. That's something that will tell you where the cocoa information came from. And then finally, we get more into more detail and say, well, has there been any sort of adjustment? For example, ground to grid adjustment on here. This will tell us whether yes or no, there's been an adjustment, how much the rotation was on that adjustment, how much the scale was on that adjustment. There's also a couple fields here for direction and distance accuracy that's going to be used for part of the least squares adjustment that'll be available with the parcel fabric. Again, 
things that are not available with simple polygons. And then finally, there's parent IDs as far as where something came from and label position. This one is really interesting. Um, as we make the change from CAD based to simple GIS based and, and sort of a cartographic model into real data models, label position and where you put a position is a really nice solution to how this works. We also have points and points have similar things, similar feature structures in here, created by, retired by, but it also has things such as, is this a control point? How did you capture that control point? All of those things, again, in that standard data model, not available with simple polygons. All right, so functionality. What functionality do we have with the parcel fabric that we don't have with simple features, simple polygons? Well, the first thing we have is that with a an active record, it actually records a whole lot of values for you. It records, for example, when you did it, how you did it, what you input, whether you input it or whether it was calculated, whether or not there was any adjustments such as a, a basis of bearing or ground to grid adjustments on here. We also have functionality inside the parcel fabric that allows us to do things like, well, once we have this end, how... Uh, how, how good is that quality of that information that's on there? We're going to show you some of the things that are in the parcel fabric to, that help you to define that. And then finally, some of the fixes on here. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to actually start editing and I'm going to show you some things inside the parcel fabric. So this is a parcel fabric and it has over the table contents. It has things like anchor points that are used for, for showing. And when we're making adjustments, anchoring, I actually have here a layer called distance mismatch. We're gonna show later where the distances don't match what it's supposed to be. And this is actually part of things we can do and show. There's links which help us do adjustment. This is the parcel fabric records in here. And these, again, the document references, what caused this change to occur, our points, connection lines, those are non-boundary lines. And then in this case, we have tax parcels as our parcel type, and it has current or active tax lines, current or active tax polygons, and we have historic grouping, historic lines, historic tax polygons. So we're going to primarily work with historic, but just sort of to show you the functionality and explore it really deeply to see if we can understand what's going on here. Up here, we have what's called a heads-up display. This allows us to control records. There's also, if we go over to our parcel record workflow tab, there's also an area over here for controlling records but this is such a great widget that was designed that we tend to use this all the time. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna demonstrate something by creating a record. This is going to start tracking what is associated with what. So I'm gonna go in and use this as a sample and say, I have a document which says there's a new parcel at the Southwest corner of parcel 739. So I'm going to go and I can reference this as this is doc demo on here. And what type of a record is it? Now, the interesting thing is that we actually can define and design what type of record types we might have. These are not required, but it helps us to go and do searches. It helps us to go and figure out and, and what are we doing here? In this case, I'm going to make it as a standard, just a split. We're going to split this out of this bigger parcel. Things such as the recording date, when was it recorded? Um, 15, 2, 2, 4. Um, description. These are all optional. Um, this client actually designed, this is what we wanted to go and put in here. So you could input information about that document. You could also go and include a URL or a link over to a document if you have a content 
management system in place, or you just have a, a um, internet accessible folder of all the documents. You can input that in here. So there's a way to go and take scans and call them up and say, this is what the actual document looked like. That's all I really need to do right now. And I can create this and it will create this record. Now, right now inside the parcel fabric, I have an active record and my parcel fabric controller object is watching what I'm doing. And everything that I create, it's going to go and relate to this active record. And it's going to mark it and say, this is part of that record. This was some of the things that came out of that document that you need to go and input. So I'm going to go and do a traverse. This is a simple meets and bounds description. Let me go over here and tell it I'm going to do tax parcel lines. And by default, I can go in here and I purposely am going to map, map this so that it does not, it does not follow the actual location of the line. It possibly could have been intended or referenced that it should have started at this corner. I purposely am going to do it so it doesn't. Now up here, we see what's called a ground degree correction. A ground degree correction is where we go and, and tell it whether or not the bearing basis for the document that we're mapping, whether it's the same as what we actually have inside of our data, or to put more lay terms, whether or not there's a ground reference to where the directions are versus the grid reference to what our actual data is. Many times, if you're, you've are you got a meet some bounds description, there's, they might have magnetic, they might have assumed bearings, they might have a local bearing base. They have all sorts of ways to reference directions or bearings. This allows you to correct for that. So in here, I'm gonna go and say, let me go and define this new one. And I'm gonna really exaggerate this and say, on my deed, it says that this bearing is actually five degrees northeast. I could type that in north five east if I want, or I could just type it this way. And then it says, okay, well, if that's what it says on the deed, now show us what direction that line is in your data. And in that case, I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna click here. All I really need to do is show it where it is what it's relative to, and it automatically would go and define this. If I have a round distance that I wish to map in grid, I then can go and tell it here what my scale factor is. Either by pulling it out of the survey or out of the plat, or by just calculating it, but it will get, allow me both bearing rotations or direction, direction rotations and distance rotations. So let's go and do something. So now, remember I said that this north-south line is supposed to be five degrees northeast. And again, I can type it in this way, five degrees northeast. And I'm going to do 200 feet. All right. So there's 200 feet for me. Now, if you look, it, it looks like it's parallel, even though it has a different bearing on it. And in this case, I'm going to do the easy way. I just want to sort of show you what we can do, I can do an offset and I say 90 degrees perpendicular to that other line and I'm hitting enter and I want to do 200 feet again, then 90 degrees perpendicular again to the right, 200 feet. And then I'm going to close it out by 90 degrees. But this time I am purposely going to put something different in there, something that not what it should be. It should be 200 to close, but I'm going to tell it 195 feet. And when I say 195 and zoom in here, it's going to show that it doesn't close by, by five feet. Well, I haven't closed it yet because it turns out that I have, I have a closure tolerance of one feet. So one foot it would have closed, but five feet not. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and say automatically close this for me. And when I force the closure down here, it reported to me that there is a misclosure of five foot. And my misclosure ratio 
is 1 to 159, meaning 1 foot to 159 is equal to 5 feet to 800 feet. That's really what that means. And it will tell me what my calculated area inside of that is. Now, that all comes with standard ArcGIS Pro. But we're going to show you a little bit some of the things that it's doing as far as some of the functionality besides that. Let's show a little bit more with just Pro in that we can go in here and say, well, we know it doesn't close. We forced the closure, but let's see if we did adjustments. It would tell us what the original input was, what the adjusted values are, and what residuals there are in here. I can accept these and go fine. If it were doing this with simple polygons, I then have to go and select those lines and tell it to construct a polygon, or I have to go and take my bigger parcel and say, let's split it out with this. These things are still in the wrong place. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and tell it and use the parcel fabric and say, okay, I have a series of lines. By the way, let's look at those lines. I'm going to go and tell it, show me every line that's associated with my record every line that was constructed as part of this record. And now I can see that they're all here. And when I click on one and I go down, it says, oh, everything is associated with this global ID, which is the record global ID. It automatically is relating things to my document, to my record without me having to do anything. But let's look further at this, some of these other fields. It is it is storing the information that I input, showing what the actual length was. But as I go down further, there's also this Kogo type field. The Kogo type field is telling me, oh, this was actually entered by the mapper. So this is something that comes from the record and you can actually put a lot of trust in there. This is... This is a good value that's stored. The other values, by the way, would be from geometry. If I just put something in there, I just went and entered a line, and then I went back and I said, calculate what the Kogel values are on this. It would say, these values are calculated from the geometry. Or the third option is, if I had want something in here, and I went and did a something with a, a record that would go and cause it to change. For example, maybe I did a split, maybe I did a line intersection, maybe I did a divide. I changed that line in some way and it, it resulted in new Kogo values. It would tell me that those Kogo values were computed values. They were not input by the mapper entered. They were not calculated by the software initially as far as those initial lines but they have been impacted. That's what the Kogo type field is. Very important field, not in simple features. All right, let's go down one more, one more line here. This is ground to grid. It tells me whether or not there has been a ground to grid correction associated with this line. Very important. Not only does it tell me whether it's ground to grid or not, it tells me what the rotation and the scale factor was on those lines. So it automatically goes and tracks and documents what's been done on that line. Who did it? When did who did it? When did they do it? All of that is still being automatically automatically in the parcel fabric with no extra work by the mapper. It's automatically being generated by them. All right, I've got it in there. Let me go and check and see if, if these lines close and form a closed polygon. That's actually called create seed. What create seed does is it analyzes the lines that are associated with the record and determines whether or not it's closed, or whether it form, the lines form a closed polygon. Since I have forced this, it will form a closed polygon in here and will create an indicator. This is actually a little polygon, an indicator saying that's, that's a parcel. 
and it's going to form a closed polygon. So you've met the criteria of having formed closed polygons. And I can tell, go ahead and build that thing out. Now, when I build that thing out, it actually creates a polygon in there. That polygon, all right, I can, I can name it whatever I want. This is standard attribution. And then I can tell what type of a polygon is it. In this case, I said this is a this is a land parcel. This this is from this one client. And as I go down, there was no stated area on the document. Maybe it said it was one foot or one acre. And in this case, this is what it's actually calculated at, both in acres and in square feet. All right. And Here's the legal start date of this. When did this start? This actually came from my record. My record had that this was the start date. Let's go and show that. Let's go to our properties over here. It said our legal start date, our recording date was 1-15. So again, it's automatically calculating values across these elements without the mappers having to do anything. All right, again, it still shows me that this is in fact part of the same record on here. It also shows and stores the misclosure ratio. All right, so I am documenting as I'm going through, I'm documenting everything that I did on here. And my misclosure distance was five feet on here. And this was the ratio. So I have created a parcel. It's not in its correct place because it turns out that my legal description said that it's supposed to start at this corner of this parcel, the southwest corner of this parcel. And then it's supposed to go north five degrees along this line. Then it's supposed to go perpendicular for 200. And then it's supposed to go perpendicular again for 200 to the south line of this parcel 739. In survey terminology, those references are called monuments. Those are, are record monuments on there or even physical monuments. Those are references to where these things are supposed to be, not just the bearings and distances, but where those things are supposed to be. Those guidances, those guidances in your legal description. So how do we correct that? The parcel fabric allows us to go and do a, what's called an aligned parcel. What this aligned parcel will do is it will take what we just did, it's associated with this record, and it will calculate the closest monument, the closest corner here. And once we tell it to generate these links, it will create links saying, closest monument to this is here. So it'll go and put that at that monument there, and it will wind up moving it to there. Up here, because there's a rotation, it might go and do something else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and change this. Instead of one foot, I'm going to make this five feet and tell it to regenerate this. Now what it's doing is it's saying, okay, I'm going to find not just points. I'm going to find lines. And I'm going to go and associate and move this so that is on that line in there. Now, remember, on the south end, there's... A disparity as far as where we're at. I'm going to go down here now. I can say, oh, it took this corner because it said it was supposed to be on this line here, and it's going to move this corner down to here. So it's going to go and automatically adjust the location here to ensure that it makes references to the actual monuments in the legal description if I point them out. By the way, that's what the anchor points and the links are. Let's go ahead and align this, and we can see that, in fact, it moved it down, made it contiguous to here, and put it in there. Again, a functionality that's not in simple polygons for it. 
these little things, these workflows, the tools that Esri had put in here makes the life of the parcel mapper so much easier um, as far as doing things on here. I now have to go and clip this out. I have to go and take this and split it out of a larger parent parcel. So I'm going to tell it to go ahead and clip this. All right. It's going to say, this is what we want to clip. And I can tell it, I uh, only have tax parcels on, so I can say, go ahead and clip it. Clip it out of whatever layers I have turned on right now, and it will clip it out of here. When it clips it, what's going to happen is it's going to go and create this remainder parcel. On um, And this remainder parcel will have its own new acreage calculated, new stated area in here. Uh, that's it. That was a different unit on the stated area. Um, here's a new stated area. And most importantly, what was the legal start date? And here is the reference to what created this change. This is a reference to the same record. In addition, it created historic data. So now we have a historic data and said, okay, when did this one occur? When did this one occur on here? And you'll note they all will show you not just what was what record reference actually created that document, but what actually marked it as historic. You see who did it, when did they do it, and such, and when did it actually become historic on here. So some of the components that are built in here in the parcel fabric for parcel mappers is the ability to have this enhanced structure in place that has this ability that automatically goes and records and calculates these values for you without you having to fill anything else in. We're not really going to look at attribute rules, but we are going to look at other things in here. For example, once I have this in here, it looks okay. It looks like a good parcel. You and I know that when I built this, though, I built a five-foot bad data in there. I built in a, a line in here that's not correct. It was mapped as 200 feet, but it says it was only five foot. And normal, within simple polygons, you can't find that. You don't know what it is. You, you might be able to do some real intensive analysis and say, well, show me all the ones where there's a variance between what's stored and what the actual numeric value of, of the COGO was. You don't have to do that in a parcel fabric. The parcel fabric has the ability under the quality tab to go and do things such as show me where there's a distance mismatch between the lines and the values that are stored on those lines. Let me go in and show you. So here I can see that these all have distance mismatches as far as what's on there. And, and if I actually go and look at it, it will show me what the mismatch is all the way around here, as far as my adjustments and everything. A really good way to go and look at the quality of the data that you have and recognize that this is what we used to think was good data. The reality is that if you honestly look at it, there's areas in here that are not mapped correctly as far as their distances, or there's a variance in there between what is mapped and what it really should be. Again, you want to be able to go and evaluate your data and change what you're creating. You're not creating a map anymore. You're creating actual land record data, lines, polygons that tell it when was it created, who did it, what did you do to it, is it correct, is, is it in compliance with all your standards and such. So that's these, these quality control layers in here. And you can look at distance mismatches on connection lines, on all the other lines in here. You can look at line vertices where you've got vertexes on those lines that, that may or may not be valid. 
you've got lines that are too short. If they, they are smaller than a certain value, they might not be acceptable for you. There's all sorts of things that you could evaluate. It does not change the data. It just points out those areas where you might have problems. Another one of the components that you don't have with simple polygons is this highlight. This highlight is the ability to go and look and analyze whether or not you have gaps or overlaps within your data. This is one of those notorious things where usually you put on a topology rule and it doesn't tell you until after you've run it and then you've got to go and fix it. Well, with the parcel fabric, you can real easily say, well, let's go and make these red just to see these variants on here and say, let's go ahead and check this area. In this case, you'll see a little dotted line going all the way around here. And I can go and check and see, do I have any gaps or overlaps in here? I can zoom out and do it here. It turns out I don't have any on this. Do I have it here? I don't see any. This is... This day, I should have picked out some data. That had, there we go. I've got a problem here. I've got a gap. If I zoom in here far enough. I really did zoom in there, didn't I? There it is right there. All right, let me go and clear this so I can see it. There's my gap. All right, so the ability to go and identify that you have gaps in here really helps you to make sure that you can maintain your data, the quality of your data and such. It's so much nicer. All right, let's go back here. So. Again, we talked about the structures, talked about the functionality that's associated with the structures, the fact that you can record the values as you're doing your normal mapping. It records what record is associated with, who did it, when did you do it, um, what were the values, did you enter it, were they, that sort of thing. Adjustments, uh, display variances in here. One of the things we didn't talk about yet was if I go in here and I select my polygon that I created with this record, all right, that's this one here, it tells me, again, what my misclosure ratio, my misclosure distance on here, it tells me all of that. If I go and look at my lines, they told me, in fact, what my, what my um, rotations were, whether it was ground to grid, it tells me all of that in here. All right, let's look back here. Um, fixes. In fact, it allows you to go and do this. There are fixes. Most of the fixes are the same as inside of standard RTS Pro, but there's more enhanced fixes. For example, on here, there's a thing where I can merge points and use that to go and, and build this. I also have one called Reconstruct from Seed. This is one I'll be talking about later in which I could go, if I have problems with my parcel, I can rebuild that and tell it to rebuild it again after I've done this. Um, it's a really nice tool to help you go and clean up data. Again, these are all quality associated. One of the things I really like about the parcel fabric is the fact that, and let me go way back now to my original display, and I probably should have. Um, got to bookmark this. Let's go and find some an area here. Yeah, this is a this is a good area right here, where right now we've got the ability to go and display labels. And I'm going to go and turn on my labels on my tax lines. All right. And on my tax lines, I can see whether or not I've got any 
values in here. Um, so here's, here's some in here. And I can see that normally you would have something like this where you've got um, 150, 150, you've got this overall distance and such. With the parcel fabric, I can go and tell it to go and evaluate this information and determine which side of the line to go and place my label on. Is this a different label from another one and such? So I can go in here and tell it to do what's called a reconstruct the boundaries of those parcels that I've selected. And from that, it went and took these labels and said, these are actually supposed to be inside this polygon and that this is the overall dimension on the outside of the polygon. It went and located correctly these labels for me. So if I went undo, you'll see where they all bunch together. And here with my redo of the reconstruct, it went and consolidated, put the labels exactly where they're supposed to be. One more thing on here that you don't get inside the parcel fabric is with these labels, all right? And I'm just looking at this one line here. Where did my Kogo type come from? If it was entered, it will look just like this. If, however, it was from geometry, it will go and have brackets around it. Those brackets signifying that this is not from the record. This is not from the document. Or I can tell it that it was computed in which case I can have a plus or minus after it. So again, by having the ability to go and define where information came from, it helps us to understand better what it is and, and to evaluate whether or not these parcels are good on here. Um, yeah. Displaying variances, writing fixes. So let's talk about what we have a little bit of time left. Um, so I also have a comment in here. It'd be interesting to see the differences symbolized in a color rant to see what areas are worse than others. That's a great idea. Well, you know what? Something very interesting. If I look at this, it turns out this is a simple little display area. All right. So all it really does is it made a selection of the lines where Let's do this. Let's look at this. And I look at the properties and there's actually a definition query on this. And it says, show me the absolute value of where the distance field, the Kogo value minus, minus the shape length is a half of a foot plus or minus this times this. So there's some variance in there. Let's edit this just to make sure. Um, and the retired by record is null, meaning it's looking only at current lines. Well, you know what, that, that right there, I could go in there and I can go to my symbology. And instead of doing it on a simple one, I could do it in some sort of graduated colors where I tell it what the field is that I'm looking at. And again, if it's calculated, I could do it, but it will allow me to go and set up this variance in here and see as you suggested, where the really good ones are, where the bad ones are, and it'll show me what those differences are in here. Yes, it, this is a simple little display layer that you can go and set up and customize to be whatever you want it to be. Again, um, it's a great idea. It doesn't come straight out of the box like that, but it doesn't prevent you from doing that if that's the way you want to start looking at these rather than just looking at them as that orange color on here. Yeah. Workflows. Um, one of the advantages is that we can simplify the workflows. And these are the workflows for a parcel fabric to do a merge, for example. As with everything, you create a record, select the parcels to be merged, select the merge tool, and then attribute. It automatically creates history. Splitting things by meets and bounds. Again, create the record, input the boundary, close the traverse, create a seed, build it, align it, clip it, you're done. And if you compare this workflow to what's in the parcel fabric, 
or excuse me, what's in simple polygons, there's similarities, but there's also differences. There's a huge amount of difference in the amount of information that's being calculated and collected as far as what's going on. Uh, but there's there's differences in here. Uh, splitting by meets and bounds description. Second way to do this is where you just draw the line. Aliquid descriptions. Aliquid descriptions is really nice, and it makes sure that everything has lines and points and everything on there. Um, again, the, the workflows are so much easier. They're predefined. There's actually, as a matter of fact, there's a set of tasks that you can use for that. Only got a couple of minutes left here on the work on the workshop. Let's go and finish with this. This is the very important point I want to make sure. What we've done is we've evolved over the last 40, 50 years of parcel mapping with some sort of software. We've evolved from, to put it bluntly, being able to lie. We've evolved from just drawing a line and putting a piece of text there and saying, that's what that line is supposed to be, to actually mapping it and having the software be able to go and quantify, is this line what it's supposed to be? That, so that no longer are we using cartographic license to go and put something up there that may or may not be the truth because it now provides us with the ability to go and analyze and say, is this really what's out there? You can now go and honestly create land records and have them reflect what it's supposed to be according to the documentation. So what I call truth in lending or truth in labeling, that finally we can be completely transparent. A lot of us may not want that, but I think that this is one of the greatest benefits of the parcel fabric is that we can be honest about what this is. We can be honest about identifying where there might be issues in our data and actually go and fix it. We can reflect the actual values of the data. And I think that's where we're heading. We have to do a better and better job with all of our data especially when we consider how much other departments are relying upon the data and how much the general public is looking at our data and scrutinizing our data, we're going to be tasked with doing a better job. And the parcel fabric helps us to do that. So please, when you're making this change into ArcGIS Pro out of MAP, consider how you're actually maintaining your parcels now and think about can I do better? And I think you're going to find the parcel fabric is a really good solution. As a matter of fact, it is the solution now to help you do this better. All right. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this and we'll see you next time.